Hello, and welcome to another episode of Theater XYZ, a podcast where people from different backgrounds will be talking about issues facing the theater industry today. We're your hosts, Bailey Sheehan. Tom Ocampo. And Matt Fergasso. We'd like to welcome you to our show, and before we get started, we'd like to take this opportunity to respectfully acknowledge that we are hosting this land from the traditional lands of the Lene and Lafay people who have stewarded this land for generations. Today, the Z joining us is Dom Ocampo. Did I get that right, Ocampo? Yeah. <laughs> okay. A current student here at Lehigh University. And the topic we'll be discussing today is whether or not theaters have an obligation to address social justice issues. We'd like to acknowledge that we're all here to learn and discuss, and that as people, we can grow and our opinions can change. Nicole Brewer, an anti-racist theater educator, put it perfectly when she said the following. We must recognize that we are both learning and unlearning, and while we are doing that, we are going to create harm. So, giving ourselves the grace that allows ourselves to speak in draft, and knowing that that does not define who we are, that it is not the final version of ourselves. This is really important towards forgiveness and building our shame resilience and being able to show up and do this work. So we've been doing this podcast for a little bit. And at the end of last semester, we received some really great feedback that people wish uh, they knew the backgrounds of the people talking about these different issues just to see where we're coming from. Uh, so I'll start. This is this is Bailey here. Bailey's voice. Um, I am a 28 year old, not quite straight, question mark, uh, cisgender white woman. And I use uh, she, her pronouns. Uh, I am Matt. Uh... This is Matt's voice. I am a 34-year-old uh, straight cisgender white male, and I use he, him, his. So I'm Dom. Hi. I'm a 20-year-old pansexual or otherwise queer Filipino-American woman, and I use either she, her, or they, them pronouns. Cool. So that's who we are. Um, so today we are talking about uh, obligation to address social justice issues. Uh, so let's quickly like break that down into a few parts so we know what we're talking about today. Um, so the first part, obligation. By definition, it means uh, the condition of being morally or legally bound to do something. In our case, it's morally. Are we morally bound to do what we're asking? I'm going to skip the addressing part for just a second and jump to social issues. What are social justice issues? Uh, things like voting rights, climate justice, universal health care, homelessness, the housing crisis, systemic racism, gun violence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, these are all issues facing people in the world facing our society. And then lastly, the main topic of today's podcast, what it means to address them. Uh, people and individuals, they can address these issues by uh, reading, educating themselves, donating to causes, volunteering, getting involved with local politics, using their platform to bring these to the forefront of other people's minds. But today we're talking about theater. If theater companies and the theater makers who work at the companies have an obligation to use this platform to engage with social justice issues. As in our previous podcast, we'll also be referencing the We See You White American Theater document. If you haven't already checked that out, please do so. We'll be using the term BIPOC frequently, which stands for Black Indigenous People of Color. And it's not just our opinions. Uh, we also sent out a survey to our theater circles on the internet uh, to get some responses about whether or not people feel that they had an obligation to address social justice issues. I think a great way to start this off is getting the thoughts and opinions of the three of us on this podcast now. And we're going to start with Dom, who is a current Lehigh student involved with a few different projects. Uh, give us a little intro as to who you are. What do you do? Do you think we have a moral obligation to address social justice issues in theater? Yeah, so hi, I'm Dom. I'm currently a junior at Lehigh in the Ideas program uh, with concentrations in mechanical engineering and theater. So I just want to go into everything like scenic, lighting, what have you, design. Um, I do a lot of work at Lehigh with the Pride Center as the speak intern, and I'm secretary of Lehigh's theater company, Mustard and Cheese Society. Most relevantly, I've been a mountaintop fellow for Beyond Bars since last summer. So Beyond Bars is a student-led project that uses social justice theater to illuminate the often overlooked consequences of the U.S. carceral system and to advocate for its abolition. Um, so that means a lot of my work in order to create theater pieces involves heavy research into the prison industrial complex, or PIC, um, how marginalized communities like queer folks and BIPOC are targeted by police and prisons, and what actionable steps exist to encourage decision makers to reallocate funds into community care. Um, so all that being said, um, I do think we have a moral obligation to address social justice. What? <laughs> yeah, who would have thought that would be my opinion? 
I think it doesn't always look like projects like Beyond Bars. Um, the answer certainly isn't going to be straightforward. Um, but I think it's really important to recognize how your understanding of cultures affects every aspect of theater making, from um, lighting design to costume design to casting. Um, and in my experience, theater is also built on empathy. Um, and so much of our audience's lives are emotionally and systematically impacted by these social justice issues. Tackling these issues isn't just a way to raise awareness and motivate progressive change, but it's also a way to connect with audiences the way that we aim to in this work. <laughs> I agree. Um, I'm going to start this by saying I also feel like there is a moral obligation, but I love seeing shows that make me... Um, like angry or guilty or like impact me on a really deep emotional level. I love seeing theater and getting that experience of like, wow, through this story they told, I'm walking away with like a greater understanding of the world. I'm walking away like with these really, I, I love the emotional burden that really heavy shows put on me. I, I feel really empowered by that. Um, but I, I agree. I think our audience, you know, we're here to connect with our audience. So you can do that in direct or indirect ways. You know, there's so many different ways to address what addressing social justice issue means. So I think it's really important, of course, to like start behind closed doors, start in your own home. You know, you have to become anti-racist first to do the work and to address social justice issues. So it's not just a bunch of like white people profiting off of the traumatic stories of marginalized people. So that's how I feel. I, I, I love a fun show for the spectacle. I love a fun show to like, wow, that's some really cool design. But like if the show doesn't have a diverse cast or designers or even an audience, even a diverse audience, it kind of loses something for me when there's not diversity being represented. <laughs> um, I believe that there is an obligation to address social justice um, amongst theater workers, specifically as this, that's the lens we're going through. I can understand the reason why, and I think we'll get into it a little more later. People or theaters don't feel they can do uh, maybe just a whole season of shows that address these issues. But I think that hopefully it can be something integrated into their season or into their thought process and i think a lot of that starts um especially depends where you come from if you're coming from like a neighborhood where diversity isn't very great to begin with how do you how do you thread that into your your theater and i think a lot of that starts at the administrative level if you can get people in uh, a place where they're deciding shows or deciding how funds are being spent or deciding who gets hired if you can diversify that part of your theater then i think you automatically are going to open the door to uh, designers or um, actors or directors, um, dramaturges who are diverse. And so by diversifying your board, let's say, right, you hopefully you can then start to diversify your cast of theater uh, makers, and then hopefully that will influence your show uh, selection and, and show progress as well. Um, so yes, I believe there is a need to address it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's really, I think it's like a really important part of how you kind of have to be the start in your community. A lot of times theater makers are like, oh, well, we don't have a diverse audience. And it's like, well, you don't have a diverse audience because you don't do diverse shows. You know, you have to be, it's kind of like the chicken or the egg, which came first. And like, you you have to be the chicken, I guess. You have to be the one that's saying like, yeah, we're going to do these and hope these people come in and invite them. And you can't just do the same shows and expect a different audience to suddenly start coming in your doors. 100%. No, I totally agree with you. It starts with it starts with making it. This kind of goes back to the accessibility episode we did, too. So if you haven't learned, listen to that one, check out our episode on accessibility. Good plug. <laughs> but something that, that Madison said that day was invite them, right? Make your theater welcoming to this to groups of people. And once you do that, you'll see them show up either as audience members or as members of the theater team. Uh, it's just making them feel like, A, they are wanted and B, that they can Mm -hmm. that they can do something for you or, or enjoy what you're doing. So making it invitationable, is that a word? Making sure that there's <laughs> an invitation to these people, um, to people in general, making the, the theater a better place for diversity is step one, making sure everyone feels welcome. You know, you might be thinking to yourself, listeners, like, of course, everyone wants to save the world. Like, why wouldn't you? Um, but as we're going to learn, like execution of that can be difficult. A lot of people think of theater as like this very progressive thing in the world. And it definitely can be. There definitely is a lot of. So while the three of us agree that we should uh, address social justice issues in our work, you're going to hear from people that we uh, 
in our survey that might not agree with us. Yeah, so uh, we created this survey to send out to the theater community asking if they felt an obligation to address these issues in their work. Um, there were a couple of follow-up questions like, do you feel like you have power in your position to affect change in your theater's culture? And um, what might be preventing your theater from addressing social justice issues in your season? Then we kind of tried to look at different responses based on different criteria. So how did people of a certain age feel about the questions? How did people across different genders or sexual identities feel? Um, how did people of different socioeconomic classes feel? We ended up having 60 people respond, so not a huge sample size, but enough to give us a little food for thought. So I'd like to read a couple standout quotes from people when we ask the question, do you as an individual theater maker feel you have an obligation to address social justice issues? Why or why not? One person said, no. While there certainly is a need for some theater to address social justice issues, I do not feel like every production must do this. There is value in escapism that production teams often overlook, and it is our job as theater makers to create art for everyone. Social justice issues are very complex, and if a company only produces work with social justice tones, they are bound to alienate their audience. Um, there was another quote that we got as well. Um, here's one for you. Uh, yes, absolutely. Art has been a conduit for social change since its inception. We have an obligation to not only show what life is, the good, the bad, and the ugly, but also what it could be, both in a utopian and dystopian sense. Besides, a huge portion of artists live on the, the margins of society. By ignoring issues, we perpetuate them, thereby aiding and abetting the oppression and struggles of ourselves and our fellow artists. Yeah, and another quote we got was, I think I would say the obligation is moral and personal. I think we all have an obligation to address social justice, i.e. to build a more just society in our work, regardless of our profession. Theater isn't obligated especially to address these issues, but theater doesn't tend to be boring and irrelevant. Theater and art in general is culture's voice. If it isn't talking about what's happening in our world, why make it? Totally agree with that last one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one of the last questions we asked was if people felt comfortable, uh, if they could give us uh, their age, their gender, uh, sexual orientation, ability status, things like that. We tried to get a whole bunch of identities just so we can kind of look to see if there was anything similar, anything different. So I looked at gender identities. We had mostly people who were women identifying, slightly less male identifying people, and a small handful of non-binary or genderqueer uh, people. And here's what I found. Of all of the people who gave us a gender identity, 93% of people felt they did have an obligation to address social justice issues in their work. And that was pretty even across the board between uh, women, men, and non-binary people. Uh, but here's where it gets a little interesting. There was a few big differences between the gender identities. So only 45% of the women said that they felt they had power in their position at a company to make a difference to the theater's culture. But when asked what might be preventing them from bringing it up uh, to the top of the, the food chain, 88% of women identifying people do bring it up and fight for it. And the other 12% were uh, from freelance artists who don't have any ties to any specific theater, students who felt they didn't have power as a student, and people who either feared losing their jobs or were being blacklisted from pushing too much. So that's a pretty ju big jump from women who felt they had power and then women who did not feel like they had power, but brought it up anyway. And then on the kind of flip side of that, 65% of people who identified as a male felt they were in a position of power to make a difference to the theater's culture. And yet only 39% of all the male identifying people do or are willing to bring it up. The other 61 said they feared losing their jobs as the main reason. Another said they felt too uneducated on the topics to initiate a conversation. And some felt like it wasn't worth making waves for a losing battle, quote unquote, <laughs> and uh, that it wasn't their battle to fight. And a few other were either students or freelance artists. A quote from the survey from a straight white cisgender male on his obligation to address social justice is not particularly. Mainly due to me being a straight white guy, I feel it's better if I step aside and let the people who can actually articulate and know what the exact issues are. At this point, I feel it's better if I just sit back and listen. Personally, I disagree. I think everyone should be fighting, especially straight white men who have the power to make a change. Maybe they can get through to their other straight white guy friends, but that's just my personal opinion. Everyone should be fighting for everyone all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with that. And that like, especially as like a person of color, I appreciate the sentiment of like, 
the people who are struggling should be able to voice what they believe and what they're struggling with and should take the reins. But also, like, it's exhausting to be, like, taking the reins on a movement that you're, like, you basically, like, need for your own rights um, and your own support. Um, and at the same time, like, a lot of times people who are struggling don't have the power or aren't taken seriously. So, like, yes, we should listen to people of color and other marginalized communities when it comes to these issues. But at the same time, like, you can listen and then amplify. Like, you can repeat it to the higher ups. Yeah, there's a difference between speaking over and speaking up. <laughs> and something Nami just said, to at least uh, rings true a little bit with, with me as a cisgender white male, right? I think that sometimes even though if you want to have that argument or have that fight and you you start having that argument, like even if you start having that conversation and then somebody poses a question or a comment or a concern, I don't always know that I have the proper information to then articulate an argument or a to facilitate that conversation further. So the flip side of that is part of that is if you don't know, find out, you know, you could be doing some of your own research, right? Or you could be talking to people. Um, but someone who might not have all the information, if, if you try to have that conversation and you start meeting resistance, you might not have the tools to to articulate or to circumnavigate or to have that conversation strictly because right, I'm not living that truth. So I can't articulate that truth. But I can I almost I don't I can understand where that where the hesitance can be, because I wouldn't know how to have that conversation beyond the research I've done because I don't live that life, right? So I can kind of understand where where that person's coming from, but it doesn't mean you can't voice for hope or for future, for the good, right? I think it's also important too that like, if you don't know the answer to something, it should never stop at just, I don't know. Like one, you should either find the information yourself or two, more importantly, you know, if you're talking about say an issue of racism against black people and there's no black people in the room, I think you can stop and say, hey, I don't think any of us know this information. Let's get people from that community into this room and have this conversation. Like there's nothing wrong with reaching out to community members. Of course, you know, if you're trying to do the least amount of harm, that should be step one is getting them in the room, actually hearing what they have to say. So, I, you know, obviously letting these people speak for themselves. And if that's you as a white man using your power to get these people into the room and get quotes and get information, um, I think that's important. I don't think the answer, I, I think it's the answer to sit back and listen is great if that is sitting back and listening to the people in those communities but if it's just sitting back and listening not enough bro oh 100 and one of the one of the answers i've always respected about uh teachers or people who are you know martial arts education you know what that's a great question i don't know the answer i'll go find out or here's some information to go do your own research as opposed to just like either a making something up or be dismissing it, right? I think the best is just, I don't know, I'll find out, or here's how we can find out together. Um, on that note, um, as we were talking about, you know, bringing the right people in the room, um, I looked on the survey into how people of color felt versus what white people felt. Um, this was particularly tough because about a sixth of the participants did not disclose their race, but I definitely still found some resounding trends. Um, so, for example, while around 78% of people of color said they felt individual responsibility for social justice work in theater, a resounding 92.5% of white folks did. Um, and I wonder if this is a result of white guilt or fragility or simply just racial awareness as the 2020 uprisings in Black Lives Matter have created a very narrow focus on the BIPOC experience we've never really seen before. Um, and as an Asian woman myself, I wonder if the people of color respondents might just feel like exhaustion, like I was talking about before. Um, since like BIPOC are constantly fighting something and that's totally valid. I also found that around 22% of people of color said they felt their theater company is adequately engaged in social justice, uh, while white folks were a little more positive at 25%. Um, nearly 90% of people of color were familiar with the We See You White American Theater document, while only 73% of white people were. Um, so I think maybe this difference in attitude can be attributed to POC's lived-in experiences and generally a more complex understanding of what's going on with people of color in the theater world. Um, but most exciting, I think, was that nearly 93% of white participants responded with a strong yes to social justice, social justice in children's theater, and 100% of people of color did. I didn't realize there was such a passion for it across the board, and I know there was very 
little of a sample <laughs> size for people of color to be like, oh my God, 100%. Um, but that's still exciting, I think. Yeah, all of the answers, we'll talk about children's theater a bit, little bit later in the podcast, but the, the whole thing surrounding children's theater, like the research we found and the survey results were like very surprising. We did not expect people to be so hyped about children's theater addressing social justice issues. And they were. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of children, Matt, age. Um, you studied age. <laughs> <laughs> you, you like that segue? <laughs> For half a minute, I was like, oh, man. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I uh, I broke down the survey respondents in, in generations across the board. Um, so 42 out of the 60 respondents that we had said that uh, they work for a theater company that does address social justice on some level. So I think that's good. Uh, 30 out of the 45 respondents from Gen X and Gen Y said their company isn't doing enough to address social justice. But most of those respondents stressed the word enough. They were like, how do you define what's enough? But almost half of the respondents said they felt like they had the power to influence change um, at their theater. 13 out of 26 Gen Y said they felt they said they felt like they could have the power, which was huge to me. I think a Gen Y half of that said that they're in a position of power or in a position in their company to make a change. And that was uh, encouraging to me that there was such a young demographic that felt that they had the position to make. I'm surprised that half the respondents said they felt they had power. Interesting. Yeah, 100%. How many were older? How many were boomers? Six of them? I think we had six boomers. Yep. The cool thing to me was all six of our respondents, and maybe it's because they work in theater, had all heard of the We See You What, uh, the We See You White American Theater document which uh, surprised me a little bit because I had talked to other people in that age demographic who had never heard of it. So the fact that all six of our responders uh, said they had. I, I feel like a couple years ago, and I feel like, you know, I'm 28. I'm not like a spring chicken, but I'm, I'm pretty new to like in my career. You know, I graduated college in 2015, so not that long ago. I, it's just interesting that a lot of people in my age range feel like they have power to change and that they are trying to enact change at their company. That's really interesting. And part of me wonders if that's um, a direct correlation to the industry. Um, I wonder if we pulled 60, 60 people in like a an engineering corporation. The We had the same amount of generation wires. If half of them would feel they were in a position to change the culture of a, of a business. Um, I wonder if if some of that relies on the fact that it is theater. And I think theater is one of like, in general, tends to be pretty progressive. I think at least in theater, people give you the, you have a voice because it is such a collaborative effort and it's a whole team thing. Um, And again, theater tends to be pretty progressive. So I wonder if if that skews maybe isn't the right word, but if that changes the percentage as opposed to like the same age demographic in a different work setting. Yeah. I also think there's less steps to the top, you know, like from my position as like resident props master to artistic director, like there's not that many steps in between, you know, like it's usually just like production manager, artistic director. So I think that might kind of lend itself to that. There's like less of a disconnect. You know, you usually see the person in charge a lot more frequently than like you might see like the CEO of a building or like the president of a college. So maybe in that way, because that it's just a smaller group of people. Interesting. That's true. Yeah, and that brings me back to something David Holcomb said. If you haven't listened to our episode on work-life balance or the Encore episode that follows that up, my, my job is to plug all the episodes today. I've, I've gotten three. Okay, so something that David Holcomb said in the interview with him was uh, he knows that some of his students are leaving the university and going into the world and enacting change almost immediately because that's what they're used to, right? The, they're used to what they're doing at college, and then they go to a place – a business and say, that's not what I'm used to. I'm used to this and it works. And there are, you know, two or three years out of college, they're already changing the system because of the way they were educated to change the system. That just was an interesting correlation to me that he said, I teach them this way, they go and do it. And that half of our whys said, I feel like I have the power to, to do what I've been taught basically and how to, how to change. I'm, I'm here for the Zoomer. I'm here for the Z generation. I love the way that things done. <laughs> it like cracks me up. Like the whole tiktok taking over like the donald trump rallies and buying all the tickets so that it was empty <laughs> like but like effective like it's a very effective way to be like i didn't really have to do much work i just made a tiktok and now like enacted this huge change i, I love that um so as a z dom how do you feel about like how your generation is going to like affect the world moving forward i'm so i'm constantly impressed by my generation and how 
passionate a lot of us are. I think especially because of the time and the place that a lot of Gen Zers, especially in America, were born and like started to form their own opinions. We've seen a lot of like crazy stuff. Um, we've seen a lot of really intense stuff that like makes the history books. Um, and I think especially because we were raised in the age of technology and we have so much more access, I think, to to education online and um, to reaching the people that make the decisions. Um, a lot of people my age have just said like, you know what, like if we have these opportunities, why don't we take them? It really, really impresses me um, how, I guess, aware a lot of people my age are in comparison to um, to a lot of like other people that are older than me. So for example, just from social media alone, I think like half of my friends have learned like more about the prison industrial mm -hmm. complex and like the background of like policing than we have at any point in our like professional like education or academia. Um, and this is stuff that like I was talking with my parents with and they didn't know anything about. So I think we're just very lucky to have. And of course, like a lot of it comes down to privilege and being able to have Wi-Fi at home and having um, a higher education um, experience. Um, but those of us who do, um, at any point, we can just pull out our phones and make a quick Google search and suddenly we know more than um, than we did like five minutes ago. And that makes a huge difference, I think, when it comes to movements like these, where a lot of it is just people not knowing that it's an issue. So I'm, I also I also find it extremely entertaining the way that my generation deals with things. Um, the whole TikTok Trump rally thing has to be like one of the funniest things. Um, and I also am an avid TikTok user, unfortunately. I'm a little addicted. <laughs> um, and like seeing that happen, like over a course of a few weeks and then it actually working was baffling. It's very creative. I had MySpace that back in the day and then Facebook. But when I was growing up and when I was in college, like Facebook groups weren't really a thing. So you were really only connected to the people that were like already your Facebook friend. Instagram was kind of new. TikTok didn't really exist. So like you only knew your circle. And can only connect to your circle or like friends of friends by seeing what they commented. So the fact now that you have like Instagram, you could connect to anyone in the world like via a hashtag or TikTok, which has a huge global reach, you know, like you can reach more people than you ever have before. And that's I think it's really powerful, like how connected the world is. And like, sure, that's good and bad in certain regards. But I definitely think, you know, being able to connect globally with people all over and like hear what they're saying like maybe you didn't know about this issue that was happening in this small town in Idaho and now you do and now you're like well that's a problem now I have to like address this I think that's I think that's really cool and really powerful uh 100% I think you both hit on what I was thinking uh was that technology is is a huge part of that and um like you said Don you kind of grew up with it always having it and I think you guys utilize it in such a great way. Um, everyone takes advantage of it. And it's how do we connect across barriers? How do we connect across the world? And how do we talk about what's important? Um, so I'm going to kind of rein us back on topic here a little bit. Um, so we're going to just briefly kind of touch on this next point. We don't want to go too into it because it is a little tricky. And that is uh, cultural appropriation, especially cultural appropriation in theater. So we're going to talk a little bit about like the different types of cultural appropriation and how it happens in theater, how we can kind of avoid it. Uh, so I'm going to just start with the first definition that we have here, which is appropriation, which is to take something and use it. Uh, usually this perpetuates harmful stereotypes. Um, for example, uh, Peter Pan, there are characters that are called Indians, even though it is a fantasy world. They are represented with very traditional Native American imagery and cultural aspects, but it's a very racist and very incorrect way to do that. It enforces those negative stereotypes and you really can't hide behind the fact that it's a fantasy world since it is based in reality. Um, so that's like a very blatant, very obvious like representation of cultural appropriation. It's it, You're taking something... You're kind of keeping it in the context of what it's supposed to be, but it, it's just wrong and racist and not helpful to the community that you're representing. So that's that's appropriation. Um, I'll define misappropriation, which is taking something um, to use it, use it without use and use it out of context. Um, so here we have an example of like we can go back to our, our Native um, American imagery, right, with uh, the headdresses at Coachella. 
their their actual things that exist in this culture and what you've done is you've you've taken it from them and completely used it um not even out of context but it it, it has you haven't even tried <laughs> to understand what it is or where it comes from or the the representation it holds in that culture you just you see it or you hear it and you take it and you make it whatever you want it to be and that's just and so that's misappropriation of something that a culture has um i can define whitewash whitewashing um which is come more into the public's eye recently. Um, whitewashing is casting white actors as characters who are non-white or of an indeterminate race. Um, for some examples, this happens a lot in opera. Um, for example, Madame Butterfly and Miss Saigon, which both have uh, female Asian protagonists. Um, also, a lot of white Aladdins get cast, and you can make the argument that like, oh, this is like a fictitious world like you do with Peter Pan, but it's also like based within like um, a very specific cultural community. So it's just disrespectful um, and happens uh, quite often. An example that I'll also provide here, um, my high school, I did, I went to a very white um, private school, but we had a huge theater community and a huge like musical draw. So every year we did a musical. And one year they decided to do, my junior year, um, Anything Goes. Anything Goes has two uh, very, very stereotypical, like blatantly racist um, Asian men um, in its cast. Um, and five Asian people, including me, auditioned, and they cast uh, two white guys and had them put on eyeliner and foundation. And it was just a horrible experience, horrible, horrible experience. Um, it's hurtful. You don't have to, like, culture is not a costume. We wanted to, um, for a second here, discuss how whitewashing can play in children's theater also and how complex that is and what that might look like. So, for example, if you have like a children's theater camp um, and most of them are white um, and it's these children's like first introductions to theater and to um, creating things and engaging their imagination. Um, what do you do when children want to do and put on a show like Mulan or Aladdin? It's complicated. Um <laughs> I when I was in high school I worked a, a kid summer camp and we did Mulan and a lot of it came up you know of like how much like how true do we have to like stick to it if the whole point is like Disney theater you know so like our set had a lot of like traditional Chinese architecture in it and the costuming had a lot of um I would not say historically accurate but like Chinese-ish adjacent on the low budget that we had costumes but again most of the the people in the cast were were white and these kids were aged uh 10 to 14 for this group and we happened to have an asian girl she was like 12 uh playing mulan but you know is it whitewashing that the rest of the cast were all white kids i mean i, I like you know we could talk about like how the leads are frequently whitewashed but like was that whole show whitewash is it a problem if we're just doing a show for the parents of these children? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's hard. It's it's a um in children's theater, specifically children's theater that isn't like there to make any money. You know, it's just like a camp and a couple. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, that's one of those tough things, right? That isn't entirely like the. It's one of those gray areas of of how do you, uh, what is the best answer? Or what is the right answer? And and I don't know that you know, we'll find that today, but maybe some things you could try are if you could, if this is going to be like an educational experience for the children and you're going to bring in, you're learning, they're learning how to act or they're, they're engaged in this whole process of this is what a stage is. And so it's an educational process the whole way through. It, it, could your theater bring in someone who is, um, who is of that culture and who can help explain the culture to these kids while they're learning how to be actors or how, while they're learning the lines, could you take an afternoon or, once a week, do you sit down and talk about what all the what culturally what all this is and what it means? At least then there's an appreciation um, and some context to what you're doing, right? And it's not just entirely you're not uneducatedly doing this, right? Like we always said, maybe look for that answer, and is is there a way to find that answer within your team and to make it an educational experience for everyone involved? But not everybody has that resource or that opportunity. Uh, but to me, that sounds like a a step in the right direction, at least. I agree. And also, I just want to add, reverse whitewashing is not a thing. In case anyone wants to make that argument, white is not the default. <laughs> if you read a character and it doesn't say any mention of race, do not think of them as white in your mind. White should not be the default in our world. 
And unless there is a character, and for some reason, the fact that they're white really matters, maybe you are doing a play about race and it's about this white person's journey into becoming anti-racist, which like, why are we centering it on the white guy? Anyway, um, <laughs> not a thing. Reverse racism, not a thing. Saying that right now. <laughs> yeah, period. <laughs> um, so that kind of brings us to uh, the more positive parts of in the cultural appropriation conversation, and that's uh, appreciation which is like recognition and enjoyment about the qualities of a culture. A lot of this, you know, maybe you're invited into a cultural cultural celebration and you're there. If you go to uh, say your town has like a Mexican American fair and there's lots of food, go there, enjoy the food. You're being invited into that space and that's not appropriating to like eat tacos, you know, um, <laughs> obviously cultures borrow from each other all the time. And that's great. It's just important to be, uh, really careful and cautious about how and when you do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's a really great point that you make about like, are you invited into this space? Or are they are they sharing this part of a culture with you? Um, and it's okay to ask also um, and ask questions and do the research if you're interested in a part of somebody's culture um, and you want to know if you can partake in it or um, especially when it comes to not even just in theater, but with like um, spiritual practices, for example. Um, Example of that would be smudging from the Native mm-hmm. American community. A lot of people um, love the concept of like cleansing the household um, with white sage and Palo Santo um, and all that kind of stuff. But then you look into the cultural meaning of that for Native American communities and how damaging it can be even financially um, with like buying Palo Santo and white sage and how um, their farms um, are not able to grow it at the rate um, that it's being asked for from these communities that aren't theirs. So it's important to recognize, I don't want to say especially in theater, but in anything, um, how best you can respect and support a culture without damaging it or um, mangling it into something that it isn't. Yeah, I agree. And I feel like a lot of this, obviously, if you're not sure, like ask someone. But I think one of the arguments I've kind of seen going around about cultural appropriation is like, is something meant for public consumption? You know, like, is it culturally appropriative to like listen to rap music, which is like historically a huge part of black culture. Like, no, this was designed for multiple, like a lot of people. It was designed for the public to hear it. Therefore, it's okay. If something you just said, like if it's sacred or religious, war bonnets, which is the the feathered headdresses that you see at Coachella, those are a very sacred uh, item of regalia for those people. And you're taking this very sacred item and like wearing it out and about uh, super disrespectful and then I think another thing, are they have they been discriminated against or are they still being discriminated against for having this? Like the example of dreadlocks. There are still people that are told that they can't go to their high school prom because they have dreadlocks and they have to cut them off. And like, you know, they, they can't find a job or they're still getting discriminated that their hair is dirty, which is not true. All of So you're taking, especially when white people have dreadlocks, you're taking this hairstyle that people are still facing discrimination against and you're just wearing it out and about and you have your white privilege to like back you up on it and then also if you listen to our cashy johnson episode took your role matt um (laughs) you know she talks about um the hip-hop theater festival with uh danny hawk and how she was very hesitant that a white man was doing hip-hop and organizing hip-hop and doing these things but they had that lived experience that defines that culture of hip-hop culture um, so that's really important. If you don't have that lived experience, it's not for you. Um, on that note, it can be difficult to figure out how to avoid cultural appropriation, especially in a theater context. You know, how do we tackle these social justice issues and make sure that communities are represented without further damaging them? Um, so that all goes back to, I think, the fact that in these complex issues, the people most affected and marginalized are always the people who are silenced or ignored or othered. Um, So as artists, um, we can use our talents to amplify their voices and lift up their stories. Um, Such a huge part of being an ally to other communities is listening, empathizing, and then passing it on to the people who do make those changes. 
Um, so in our own creative ways, we can do the same thing in our creative processes um, and even be collaborative. Um, so for example, with Beyond Bars on the project that I've worked on, um, this last fall, we created 35 short theater pieces that were either inspired by or taken verbatim um, from poetry that incarcerated women in the Lehigh Valley offered to us. Um, we were even able to sit down with a previously incarcerated Black man in the Lehigh area who took 40 minutes out of his day to sit down, tell us his story. Um, and we worked with him to create a sort of time capsule piece that illustrated um, the complex nature of his boyhood, especially as he um, grew through this cycle um, and ended up going to prison. So yeah, I think theater is constantly collaborative um, and we don't have to sit down and do all the research and write these pieces and direct them alone. We can definitely reach out to these communities and there are creatives out there who want to use their lived in experiences um, as inspiration or even a foundation um, for these projects. So we can just take the opportunity to talk with these people and basically like take what they want other people to hear um, and do it for them um, and make something that that, you know, spreads spreads the word um, and touches people emotionally in the way that theater does. And I think that's I think that's super important and kind of gives us lends us to our last little definition, which is elevation. You know, Dom is not a previously incarcerated black man. But she used her platform and her skills to elevate his story. And that's really important. There are going to be some time, especially in theater, we like to tell stories of all different people. But the main thing is you have to make sure if you are telling a story that is not your own, that you're elevating it. You're not taking the negative parts and turning it into something it's not. You are taking someone's real lived experience and doing something positive with it and staying true to what they wanted to say. Which takes us to... Um why cultural appropriation isn't always a bad thing. Um, and there are two reasons. One is cultural um, exchange of all kinds is incredibly um, important. And it's, it's such a part of our history. And I, I don't see that going away. Um, we, we share what we know and what we live and what we have with everybody else. And I think that there's just a natural blending or acceptance of, of different parts of different people's lives. So in that regard, it's not bad. We're just exchanging ideas and, and thoughts, right? And then uh, probably the world's biggest yet seldom recognized example of uh, cultural appropriation is the Christian takeover um, and makeover of Jesus. Uh, there are still a uh, there's still a lot of people who believe that Jesus was white. <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny. <laughs> it's just fun <laughs> funny that people think Jesus was white <laughs> and blue eyed, probably blonde hair. I've always seen the brown hair, but like brown hair, blue eyed, uh, white man, and he that's not. <laughs> From the Middle East. Nope. <laughs> he was the only one. That, maybe, that, maybe that's why they think. No, never mind. We won't even. He, he didn't, he didn't look like Joseph. So... <laughs> anyway, anyway. Anyway. He's clearly God. He looks that so was different Mary's from us. excuse for um, why he didn't look like her husband. <laughs> why? <laughs> so I know like we never did it and he looks not like you at all, but that's just because God did it. No, anyway. We're going we're gonna to cut this in post. <laughs> we so... say that every time we ever do. <laughs> oh, we do, and it, it never happens. But there was a, you know, there still is a huge profit on on the takeover of Christianity and the way we represent Jesus um, in general. The problem is, right, we take these concepts and we misappropriate them. And that's kind of where things what we're talking about, right? You can use things, you can you can learn things from each other. But the problem is when you when you take it and then you make profit out of it, or are you taking without doing your research? Are you taking without um, permission from people who who still are alive today, who live this culture, who you can talk to, <laughs> to make sure you're doing it right. One of the biggest things is kind of, we said, if you don't know, ask, right? Can you find someone in this community who you want to represent? And are they willing to have a conversation with you? Can they help you do any further research? Can they tell you, okay, yes, you know, we did wear these, these war bonnets, right? But there was a time and a place and this is what they represented. So no, you can't just walk on stage with that. It would have to be done in this regard. Um, and then, the final part of that that makes it a little tricky is you have to do your homework on that, right? You can't just walk up to any random person of that community and say, hey, I'm going to do this thing. Are you cool with that? And then they say, yeah, cool, man, whatever, you. And then you go and do it. And you said, well, no, I got permission. But you, you didn't, right? You you really need to kind of go through the right channels, do the research, do the navigation, do your homework. And um, I think you need to be held accountable for that, right? So I think that's a perfect spot in a playbill to be like, 
we represented these people. These, these are the people we talked to. We were cleared by this person who is, you know, deemed worthy of this, of saying yes by these other people. So and then you can say, hey, look, we did all these things. And if we're still wrong, we apologize. But look at what we we tried to do the steps and do the homework to make it, to do it the right way. Um, and it's always going to be a learning process. But I think if, if you start by saying, I want to do something with this, finding out how to do it properly, and then and then acknowledging the fact and the people that you've talked to. And to go from that, if you still aren't sure, if you still can't get the information from whatever group, just don't do it. Just avoid it. If you aren't, if you are <laughs> thinking about doing a play, but you're not sure how to do that, there are millions of other plays in the world. It is so easy to avoid it if you aren't completely sure of how to do it in a respectful manner. It's so much better to just pivot than to do something wrong and maybe add that show to your season next, you know, next year. So you have a whole year to like be informed about it. And this is step one of how to address social justice issues. Don't appropriate other cultures. Um, and like Matt said, there are tons of resources. Um, I recommend joining. There are tons of theater Facebook groups and there are also uh, Facebook groups that are called like free emotional labor uh, where you can ask people questions like this and they're willing to like help you and understand that you're coming from a place of trying to become more informed and they can explain like, hey, you're going to cross a line if you do this. And it's just kind of like a, a brave space, not a safe space, but a brave space to be like, hey, I'm kind of thinking about doing this. And then someone will be like, absolutely not. Here's why. And I'd also like to highlight a guide put out by Simon Fraser University in Vancouver called Think Before You Appropriate, Things to Know and Questions to Ask in Order to Avoid Misappropriating Indigenous Cultural Heritage. Uh, so it's a super great resource for avoiding misappropriating Indigenous culture, like the title states. But pretty much the teachings and the guides in it can be applied to so many other things of like how to not appropriate other cultures. <laughs> um, but again, I just want to emphasis, if you are not 100% sure, just avoid it. Just avoid it. Just move on. Ask questions. Go talk to people. But what happens when you don't move on? What happens if you do <laughs> culturally appropriate, even though everyone told you not to? Let's talk about cancel culture, my friends. Is it a real thing? Eh, there's a bunch of articles that say it's not, that it's call out culture. It's about accountability. I am going to share this quote from Francisco Mendoza uh, from a Medium article titled, Cancel Culture is a White People Problem. Racism is a centuries-old problem in this country, and if the weight of that is comparable in the company's eyes to the pressure of being on someone's shit list for a couple days, then that company is failing to comprehend the magnitude of the issue. Because let's be honest, if the company had been doing the work, if it could honestly be said that it has not profited from or been complicit in white supremacy, no one would be putting it on any lists. No one would be asking for any statements. Said company would rally for donations or open its lobby to protesters, not because its audience or staff is pushing it to, but because leadership took the initiative to stand by the movement in its time of need. That's pretty much it. You can't be called out or canceled if you didn't actually do something wrong. That That's that's it. <laughs> yeah. I think that the, the other side of that is if you aren't and someone calls you out on it, how are you making amends for that? Are you simply removing that one article and now you're like okay good it's gone and all is well and done or are you actively making a progressive movement toward uh diversifying uh your company or yourself or your whatever the issue is um i don't think it's it's good enough to just say to delete it and forget about it or say oh we made a mistake but then keep making that mistake they're calling you out and it gives you a chance to either a get on board or b not but then if you get canceled that's not their fault that's yours for having something pointed out to you and then totally ignoring or trying to do better the next time i think that's where like the idea of accountability comes in like you don't get you don't get completely canceled unless like bailey said like you've clearly done the wrong thing and you don't want to like provide reparations or educate yourself on how how to pivot and how to make it better for those people i think it looks different when we're talking in like theater terms and on business terms versus when we're talking about the individual person. So when we're talking about the individual person, there's that whole idea of like, we should shift from cancel culture and call out culture to calling people in. Um, and the idea that, um, you know, we should be patient and meet people where they are and understand that not everybody is as educated um, on certain social justice issues as we are and give them the opportunity to, um, to learn from their mistakes um, and move forward with 
a different light on things. But this looks different when we're talking about businesses <laughs> because they're profiting off of off of these mistakes. And when businesses are worried about what it'll look like for their brand for doing the right thing and are not responding to um, the protests or the concerns um, in a way that validates the struggle of the people who are who are bringing it to their attention like we at least in my opinion we do not owe businesses the the empathy that we often do with individuals who who make these mistakes we, and at the same time um a lot of the times it's like these companies will come out with um statements or um be like we're so sorry and this is how how we might want to move forward and be like we made a mistake blah 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 but if that's it and they don't they don't make any changes to their to their theater company's model like what does that really say about how how they value um these social justice issues in these communities um and through all of that like these communities mm -hmm. don't owe it to them to forgive them and keep giving them their money they they don't nobody owes anybody forgiveness in these situations so i guess all of that's to say like if you get canceled you get canceled <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> um, I don't think we necessarily need to erase a lot of the problematic, um, you know, art or TV shows or movies in our past. I think it's important to not erase them, but to change the light on them. I think it's okay to look at a piece of art and be like, this art is problematic. And here's why it's problematic. If you look at, I mean, we were taught all about Christopher Columbus discovering America, which we know isn't true. So it's important to look at him as a genocidal maniac. And also it's important to look at America for glorifying him and the textbook writers and our teachers for not, you know, all of that is a problematic piece of American history. And we can't just say like, okay, we're never going to talk about him again. We have to look, we have to talk about what he did, talk about how we treated him for hundreds of years you know it's okay to know these things exist but that doesn't mean we're gonna hang a portrait of christopher columbus on the wall i also want to say real quick what is that quote about like if you don't speak up you're siding with the oppressor that's how i kind of feel about a lot of these cultures or these companies that never made statements by not making a statement you're already siding with the people in power um just back to your history the history thing is i think that's entirely on point you know if there's a you know saying those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. There were a lot of awful things done in the past, um, and if we just completely cleared them of you know off of existence, then you won't ever learn or be reminded that that's a thing that happened. Um, oh, and by the way, it's preventable. Like we can we can overcome these things, especially if you see it. If you can start lining things up, like this was how this started. This wasn't right, or this is how Christopher Columbus was treated. Let's avoid that in the future. And if we were to totally get rid of that, then you wouldn't have that lesson to learn from. So it's important to, to keep them, but it's important to learn lessons from them um, and how to move forward appropriately. Um, it's something Dom said earlier about how the theaters themselves have to actually like start doing the work. Is I mean, that's like step number one. You can make all the statements you want, but unless you're actually doing something about it, you're just admitting your, your issues, but not actually trying to change. So I think that's important is that we have to, that's what cancel culture is. It's... You want to be uncanceled? Great. Apologize and do better. Yeah. Um, I think that connects a lot to um, this other really interesting insight from our survey. Um, the server taker said here, not all theaters have to have strong social justice external messages if they're doing the hard work internally in who they're, who they're representing, hiring, or funding. Shows about social justice worked on by and in oppressive systems or environments are not actually about social justice. The content on stage is the least of the problems we should be tackling. And then another survey taker said, we need to start with equity within the organization itself. If the board, the leadership and administration are all homogenous, then we've already failed. Um, so I think that goes back to the idea that like a statement's just a statement. Um, and you can put on as many um, controversial praise as you want, but if you're not representing the people who are asking for it um, and doing the work on the inside to make sure there aren't um, oppressors that are doing the opposite of what you want, um, then you've got it backwards. Um, 
you have to make sure that the foundation of your theater company and the foundation of the project isn't built on some sort of oppressive system or something that holds these marginalized communities back. If you are a all white organization doing shows about, you know, racial inequity, you're just profiting off of their trauma. If you're not actually doing the work, if you're not giving them discounted tickets, if you're not bringing them in. Um, so the We See You White American Theater document, which we talk about a lot, uh, and it covers a lot of the injustices and demands and how we should correct them. It barely re- like covers the content of the shows you should do. It doesn't really mention anything about what plays to do and what plays not to do, but it covers a lot on representation of people on stage, people behind the scenes, people in administrative roles, making sure that uh, salaries are more equitable. And by doing this like passive work of filling your company with underrepresented people, that's more important for social justice than white people doing shows about it. And then the only note that they really said about the content of the shows is to stop exclusively doing shows where it's uh, BIPOC trauma and sadness. And that's not a full representation of lived experiences and to stop doing shows that, you know, reinforce like the sad black narrative. You know, these people have joy and triumph and celebration and of course struggle, but not just that. So we need to show the full range of human emotion You know, like we have to lift them up. And by showing a triumphant community, that's definitely one way to lift them up. Something that comes right out of the uh, the We See White American Theater is um, how kind of inherently uh, classist and elitist and racist all the practices uh, that most theater companies have already are, you know, to get a job, probably making, you know, minimum wage, being a waiter, being a bartender. So you can go on auditions and then you get a part. Well, now do you give up your first job because you got a part or do you have to switch your schedule so you can go to shows and then, you know, 10 out of 12s and practices and matinees and late night. If you're a single working mom or minimum wage, how do you at all find time to either hire a babysitter or to cook dinner for your child or to if you don't have a car in New York, how do how are you getting from point A to point B? Um, so there's just a lot of practices that the the document also addresses in, in, in standard procedures that most people in theater probably take for granted. Uh, the work calls, the nine, 10 out of 12s, the long, you know, the two show days, getting to the theater, all those things that mm-hmm. I, I know I've taken for advan- like uh, for granted. I've never had any of those problems. But when you sit and look at it, you're like, if I didn't have money, how am I supposed to then go on auditions? And if I can't go on auditions, how am I going to get a job? And if I don't have money, how am I going to get a babysitter? And all these problems that just affect a large part of the people that um, kind of goes unseen. But I think is a great was a great place to bring up some of these practices that inherently are just sort of a bad for people and and b make it harder for marginalized people to be part of theater. It's the foundation of theater culture itself. It's everything that theater is currently built on is inherently racist. Which, I, again, I had, as a, a white person who works in theater, you know, I had no idea that all of these things, until the We See You What document, I'm so grateful that they put that document out because it is, every part of it, they always say, you know, like, here's how to elevate people. Here's how you're keeping people down. The obligation to address social justice issues, it has to come from inside the house first. It has to start with filling your theater with a diverse group of people. I'm making a lot of declarative statements Agreed. this episode. <laughs> And I stand by all of them. So, <laughs> and it, it, I've just been kind of thinking about how what Dom covered about how more white people uh, than people of color are like. We have to make a change, and I absolutely think it is. All of these things are brought to our attention now versus a lived experience of constantly fighting for them your whole life. You know, like all of a sudden, like I was made aware to all these issues, and I'm like, oh my god, these are horrible issues. Why is no one talking about this? And they've all been like, yeah, we've been talking about it for a long time. Thanks. <laughs> You're not alone. I'm very thankful for the education that the Black Lives Matter movement has taught me. I'm I'm sorry that it took this long and that it's still taking this long. But um, So it kind of seems like a lot of the heat and urgency from the Black Lives Matter movement has kind of been overshadowed by COVID, which is another really unfortunate circumstance that we are in. Um, but is there a way to champion both? Is there a way to have concern for both things at the same time and kind of fight for both things in theater? Uh, a lot of the studies that are coming out are showing how Black people, Native American people, Latin and Hispanic people are at a higher risk of COVID. And a lot of people in marginalized communities, which are already disadvantaged, are going to be disadvantaged first. Uh, and if we don't take care of our disadvantaged communities, whether it be people with disabilities, homeless populations, Black people, Asian people, immigrants, 
Uh, they won't be able to show up to participate in theater when we do return to a typical performance season, uh, whether it's due to health issues, losing their income, losing their homes, um, whatever the reason is. A lot of people aren't going to be able to return to theater when this is all over. That quote we keep hearing. And, you know, personally, I, in my own life, I felt the tension between the two. I'm am a very paranoid COVID person. You know, I'm always, 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 always wearing a mask, constantly six feet away. I am always staying at home. But I did go to Black Lives Matter's protests during the summer because to me, showing up was too important not to. That the risk of getting COVID outside at a protest was less of a risk than not showing up for the Black community and not being one of those people that's saying, hey, we see what you're doing and we're not okay with it. I I think there is a place for both working on theaters reopening for COVID and adjusting for COVID and fulfilling the we see you what demands. Yeah, I totally agree. I think what you were saying about how um, marginalized communities are the first to be disenfranchised because of COVID, I think one of the most important points that theater companies are going to have to remember moving forward is that um, these social justice issues and COVID are intrinsically connected. Um, So yes, we're worried about um, like making sure that theaters are COVID safe and how like to financially recover um, and how just, you know, how we're going to move forward working on different projects um, and making theater accessible in circumstances like these. But at the same time, it's so hard for, imagine like white theater companies, like majority white theater companies um, to consider like how they can continue to profit within COVID times. Um, But then when we think about what um, black and brown theater projects look like or um, otherwise like controversial or social justice projects look like under COVID circumstances, um, those are even further um, pushed to the side because of this. Um, So I think that there can be a healthy balance in between where it's like, you know, we need to make COVID theater accessible to all and for everybody involved. Maybe like one of the ways that we can approach making sure that, um, for example, like the Black Lives Matter movement isn't overshadowed by COVID is putting the marginalized people in charge of safety procedures and conversations. Um, And just like having the right people in the room when talking about this, about how specifically um, these measures and these plans might impact them and many of their lived in experiences. But it's also just like really, I hate, I hate, hate, hate the phrase like we're in unprecedented times, but like Mm -hmm. it really is true. Like there is no simple answer to like how are we supposed to tackle all of these problems? And it's, it's hard to, to balance, but it's like so essential, um, especially for people of color and other communities that are in this industry right now. If you're already making all these creative pivots, it's a great time to include more people than you like ever had, you know, like I think why limit yourself to just thinking about how you're going to reopen in a way that's COVID friendly? Like it's time to rethink your whole system top to bottom. I I, I truly do think that COVID has revolutionized theater. You know, there's so many different projects and technologies and ways people are doing theater that I definitely don't think when all this is over, we're going to go back to just doing shows the way we did. I think it's going to be shows plus, plus all this stuff we're doing during COVID. I want to pose a question. And um, I don't mean to be that ignorant guy in the room, and I hope I don't. I hope I don't come off that way. Do you? Do either one of you think that COVID might have actually helped the We See What document? Only, and the and the way I mean that is because there has been a great pause, right? Like in life in general. And I remember seeing a statement that said, you know, the economy has always been broken. It's just kind of taken this disaster to like make it put it in front of everyone everyone's face. Like it's not these are issues we always kind of constantly had. But we were always running from one thing to the next to the next. We were always so busy and over, always so overwhelmed that we never took the time to understand or to, to think about other things. And now that we're kind of on this great pause and that there was this document that came out kind of almost simultaneously, it wasn't immediately blown by. It wasn't just like shelved like, oh, whatever, man. And we kept going forward like there was a great stop in, in the economy and theater. And then there was this list of documents that said, why don't we address all these other things? And basically, like you just said, now that we're kind of here anyway, if we're going to pivot regardless, why don't we pivot with these all these other things in mind? So I've always kind of been under the assumption 
that COVID almost kind of helped the the We See You What document gain traction because there was time to sit and talk about it and it had time to become a thing. And not that you have to answer that. It's it, it's a statement, I guess, or a question. I don't know. <laughs> I did find a great quote related to that um, from Colorado State. It's an article titled Activism in the Era of COVID. And it basically was saying, you know, another way that the pandemic has changed the way people engage in activism, it dramatically changed like the shape of everyday lives, you know, so all these people are at home more than they ever have been either working from home or they lost their jobs. And for a lot of people, you know, like they might have been in a place of privilege for most of their lives and all of a sudden they don't have a job anymore. They don't have their income anymore. The, the quote is at the same time, the pandemic has also made people feel more isolated and in many ways less in control of their lives because the virus could make its way into anyone's home, causing a health or financial crisis or both. More people are feeling a vulnerability that they might not be used to. People are seeking to have some say in their lives in the world. It has created the perfect storm to bring more people into activism. A lot of people like really got shaken to their core. And a lot of, I feel like a lot of people even took more like political and governmental interest than they ever have because now it's, wow, I lost my job. Am I going to get paid? Wow, I didn't realize how screwed up the unemployment system was. I mean, there are some people that have been dealing with unemployment on and off their whole lives, but for some people, this has never happened before to them or anyone in their family. So I do feel like this has really made a lot of people aware of their privilege in different ways. And just to follow up on that too, something that happened, you know, that I wasn't aware of even being a thing either, uh, was that teachers who were filing for unemployment, uh, I think had a really hard time getting them because the the government's like, no, you don't work those months anyway, so we're not going to give you support over those months. And and maybe that's true. Maybe they don't necessarily work at that school or in their position, especially in theater. If you're a three quarter employee or you know, you're uh, freelancing just because it's the summer months doesn't mean they're like summer theater is a huge thing. So you can go Mm -hmm. spend two or three months and be making money just because I'm unemployed and I'm a teacher or I work in an institution that usually isn't in, you know, high gear in those three months doesn't mean I'm not missing out on payment somewhere else. Again, this just goes back to how screwed up everything is and and how I think it's engaged a lot more people um, politically and and hopefully at a, a local level as well as uh, a national level. How do you feel about COVID, Dom? Do you think it's like change? I mean, Beyond Bars happened in a completely different way than it ever has, right? With, on like a, on a in a good way. I don't want to say that I'm grateful for the COVID experience because it's clearly like traumatic and has shaken a lot of people to their core. I definitely am grateful for the creativity of people who have continue to do theater, um, even online during this time. I firmly believe, um, because before Beyond Bars, the project um, in general, they wrote some sort of documentary theater-inspired script and did an in-person performance. um, And it was very much like, um, here are two or three performance dates, people can come and go. Um, There were like photos taken, but of course, like with live theater, it wasn't... um, recorded in any way or uploaded. I think especially in terms of how social justice theater can be structured, the way that Beyond Bars happened um, for like my generation of it, um, we can say, um, it was completely revolutionized in the way um, that we we did it this year. So um, we had to do like a sort of playlist of pieces and instead of pursuing like one um, sort of script because we couldn't all meet up. Um, and because it was done online, um, we could collaborate with people that weren't even in the Lehigh area. We had um, interviews with people from the West Coast even that wanted to contribute like their like professional expertise. Um, we were able to share on our website all of the different resources that we used and even upload all of the videos that we'd made for the project for people to look at in years to come. And especially um, in terms of doing that and streaming it over Zoom, the kind of flow of questions and discourse and um, personal comments that were coming in in the chat um, while we were streaming these videos isn't something that we would have been able to do in person. Um, So in a way, it felt so much more effective um, in shedding light on the prison abolition movement in the long term, because sometimes, and I'm guilty of this, you go into like a social justice theater um, performance and you watch it and you're like, wow, I feel so impassioned and invested in this. Um, And you step out and think like, I'm gonna sign up and volunteer at like my local organization or I'm gonna do 
more like to research and stuff like that or i'm gonna look up this link in the playbill but then you never do and this year like beyond bars was able to be like we get it we hear you we are literally giving you all of the equipment at your fingertips um so that even if you do forget um you have a very straightforward way to keep investing yourself in this problem you know we keep talking about how we're gonna move forward from this like after covid is over after this is all over um, and I don't want virtual theater to go away. Um, I think that the way that we've been able to digitize and make accessible, like a lot of these experiences, like we're able to like upload transcripts that people can read along to since it's online, um, things like that. Um, I've been in like casual, like theater productions with people from like all over. Um, and to just have that sort of community with people that like don't live in your area and that sort of reach um, that we wouldn't normally have is amazing. And I think it would be a huge, like it would be a wasted opportunity if after like all of this quote unquote, people are like, okay, let's go back to doing it the way we used to and like forget about all of the um, changes we had to make. Cause like, I think that digital theater and in-person theater can coexist in a really beautiful way. And I really, really want to see it. <laughs> yeah, I, I love what you said about accessibility because that is, I mean, to me, that's like one of the most exciting things that's coming out, you know, and that's something we talked about with Madison on our uh, episode about ableism and accessibility is that, you know, there are some theaters that she, as a wheelchair user, cannot even get into the building. So now that she can see all this virtual theater and a lot of it is free because it's too complicated to figure out how to charge people for it. So now like it's financially accessible. It's physically accessible for a lot of people. I have people in my life that work night shifts a lot of the time, so they could never see any performances or things that I've done just due to the nature of their job. And now they can watch it at two in the morning when they get home from work. And then when we worked on Seen and Heard, and just the amount of love and support that was coming out and seeing people's reactions, like you do miss that. You do miss the having the audience give you a standing ovation at the end of the show. It's it's weird to me to think about like three years from now, someone could stumble upon the scene and heard video and comment on it and be like, wow, that was so great. And I'm like, wow, this has like a lasting impact. Also, you know, just like the creative pivots. I never thought I would ever host a podcast ever in my life or learn the video editing that I have to do, the audio editing for a podcast. I just paint sets, you know, that's all I do. Not anymore. I know. And like, especially at Lehigh, I'm really grateful for the leadership we have with Cashy Johnson, because she was like, if you have an idea, go for it. You're leading it now. So I'm working with some of my colleagues that I would never work with in a capacity that, you know, normally we're just in a production meeting together. I think it's going to strengthen a lot of our skills and our communication moving forward when we go back to a traditional production season. Yeah, to piggyback on that real quick, you know, it was uh, it was a huge a step I think for a lot of us it was it was a very empowering position to be in I remember the first time her and I talked about going forward with the new year and one of the things she said that's that resonated with me and stuck with me is we're going to forge the future we don't know what that is we don't know what we're going to do but we're going to make theater and we're going to make the future of theater we're, we're not like we're going to trailblaze let's go do it and that was super um I was excited I was encouraged I was empowered the whole time so this has been a, a very uh great exercise uh it's been a very great real life situation to to learn all these different skills and to feel empowered and to learn how to go ahead and figure we don't know what we're doing but we're going to figure it out it was great to have that empowerment and to be given that that platform to to make the future happen time's up for this episode we talked about this topic for a long time and we still have more to talk about so stay tuned for part two on february 10th Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you to Dom for being our special guest today. And thank you to Lehigh University Department of Theater for sponsoring this podcast. Our podcast season is going to look a little different this season, so make sure you're following us on social media to be alerted when new episodes are coming out. You can follow us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Facebook, and Instagram. Just search LU Theater. That's theater ending with an R-E. LU Theater podcast series and on YouTube. All of our past episodes are available on the Lehigh University Department of Theater channel. Catch you next time. Bye! Bye. <laughs>